Yeah, but could it, is it coming through the microphone? This one feels better than that, that's all. Um, just before I introduce uh, Robin Penty, I wanted to say for the benefit of those of you who may be staying around and even revisiting our gardens, um, there are a couple of trees I noticed in my walks across the gardens. One is a red flowering horse chestnut that was planted by Paderewski in 1904. Um, and it's, it's a glorious tree that's in full bloom. I'm not sure what yesterday's rain did to it because I didn't walk back this morning. Um, but it's on Eastern Lawn. Um, and if you want to know where it is, speak to one of the guides or speak to me afterwards. And the other one is a monkey hand tree. Um, there's one that's starting to flower, which is near the uh, glass houses. So that's, um, it's an unusual one. I won't give you the whole Latin name. Some of you may know it. But if you're interested in seeing that one, perhaps see me afterwards. Sorry. <laughs> okay. It's my great pleasure to introduce Robin Penty, who is the Executive Director, Engagement and Impact at Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. And I'll just read you a little bit of Robin's bio. Over the last six years, Robin's led an impactful agenda that's raised more than 60 million in revenue for the, our gardens, produced multiple sold out major events, new digital visitor experiences and tours, and much, much more. Um, perhaps it's worth mentioning in passing, although this does appear in the program, twice winning top honours in the State of Victoria's Tourism Industry Awards and in March 2022, the gold for major tourism attraction at the Qantas Australian Tourism Awards. And if you saw any publicity about that, Robin had a most wonderful botanical theme dress on. She's not wearing it today, just... <laughs> It was a longer, longer dress. <laughs> um, an experienced creative and business development professional with over 30 years' experience across sectors including arts and culture, environment, health, higher education, for purpose, uh, for purpose organisations and government. And perhaps the most recent um, item that most of us are familiar with was the publication of a book to celebrate the Melbourne Gardens 175th years of existence, a book called Wonder, which is full of stories. And I'll perhaps leave that there. And would you please welcome Robin. Thank you, Thank you Rosemary. And, and please let me know if you can't hear me at the back. I may just triple check. All right. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. It's my great pleasure to speak with you today. Um, just as a bit of context for the presentation, um, I will say hello and welcome to so many of you from so long a distance. Um, it's a great pleasure to come together after the difficult two and a half years we've all shared. Um, and I thank you in advance for the privilege of your time and your company today. So I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung peoples of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to elders past, present, and those who may be with us today, and also extend my respects to elders from around the world, including my birthplace in Canada. I'm going to start with some introductory remarks. I'd like to share with you that this is a presentation I gave to the 7th Global Botanic Gardens Congress at the end of September, which was hosted here at the Melbourne um, Exhibition and Convention Centre. We hosted over 500 people from 40 countries, and it, it's, the, as you all know, the peak um, organization for botanic gardens organizations around the world. And this presentation was created for a, a program stream called Surviving and Thriving Post-COVID. Um, it was written, however, about a year ago, the theme itself. Um, so it was rather ambitious, you might say. Um, but in good news now, we are moving into early recovery. So um, when I present, you'll see that that's a key part of uh, today's conversation, is how do we respond post-pandemic in a way that will be meaningful for our visitors. So one thing Rosemary didn't mention, which I thought might help you in today's presentation, is that I spent the first 20 years of my career 
uh, as a performing artist, as a dance educator, and as an arts manager. And back then, I considered my job to be this, moving people through time and space to make meaning. And regardless of the organization that you volunteer for, I think it's your role to do the same. Thanks, Jane, wouldn't mind. Thank you. So to be effective in our roles, any role in an organization, is to ask the right questions. We don't actually have to have all the answers because there's a, a huge, beautiful, wide planet that will help us uh, solve many problems. But we have to make sure we're asking the right question. And I share with you this slide because I'd heard the wonderful Professor David Caroli speak two days earlier at the Congress about climate change and his presentation as I'm sure you've heard earlier in the week and from other speakers, was quite sobering and it had many, many graphs and charts. And I decided that I didn't want to share too many graphs and charts. There are a few. But what I wanted to highlight is that climate change, amongst other global challenges at the moment, are what I would describe as a wicked problem. And wicked problems are not complicated, but they are complex. And so they need complex solutions and solution making. And I think this slide beautifully demonstrates the challenges there. So in an organization like a botanic gardens, the main problem is typically well defined. We want to improve our visitors' knowledge about biodiversity, about climate change, about the beauty of plants and the role they play in our lives. But from a solutions perspective, that's not the real problem. And it's not the only problem. And the way I think of this is, and for those of you who've ever studied design thinking, this is a, 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 a really a, a simple design thinking methodology, is that particularly in scientific organizations, we spend a lot of time defining the problem, or we should. But we rarely speak to our customers or our visitors first. And um, my focus today, as you'll see, is how do we become kind of closer to our visitors and their needs, so that then when we move through to the ideas and solutions and the prototyping, that they're with us on that journey. So I titled my talk, Evolution or Revolution. You say you want a revolution. You'll be a, um, a group that would get that reference. Um, I've been in audiences that don't. I will just share with you. Um, but this. Um, on the screen now is a, an abstract that I presented to the Congress. So I'm just going to share with, with you to make sure that I deliver on what I promised. So drawing upon case studies and examples from diverse global fields and sectors, architecture and design, arts and culture, population health and social marketing, education, industry and environment, we'll seek to better understand the stories we tell our visitors, the frames these reflect, new ways and modes of responding to urgent and demanding and evolving customer need, and explore fresh perspectives on how to elevate and amplify the vital contribution of public and botanic gardens to 21st century cities and lives. Um, and if I don't deliver on that at the end, please tell me. But it's a big ask. So if you only take four things from today's presentation, these will be them. And they're about innovation, and they're about how we define our impact. The first is about context. The second, around purpose. The third, around respect. And the fourth is, as you'd all appreciate, about communication, and indeed persuasive communication. So what do I mean by innovation? I always think if you put a buzzword in a presentation, you better define it. Um, and you know, this gets used a lot these days. But the way I think about it is it's simply a way of thinking about degrees of originality in practice. So in botanic or, uh, gardens organizations, you might expect there's a, a, a critical foundation and baseline of programmatic activity. So in our case, and I'm sure in, in all of your organizations, I consider learning programs and guiding programs like yours and ours to be a critical baseline. The organization really can't thrive without it. And there's a next level, which is discretionary, that says we want to do the baseline and we want to do it next level. We want it to have national impact, potentially. We want to influence our peers, which, of course, 
this week has been about. And to do that is going to require a bit more investment, time, effort, budget, and so on. And the third level is what I call distinctive. And that's utterly unique. Can only happen in your botanic gardens. Can't happen in mine. It's got to be at a level that will potentially have then global impact. So in defining that, the way that I, we think about impact here at the gardens, and um, just to reinforce what I've just said, there are typically three realms that we consider organizational impact. And at the Congress, we talked a lot about the bottom circle, about the environmental work that the, our organizations undertake. We heard very little at the Congress about the social dimension of the work of botanic gardens, and in fact, next to nothing about the economic impact of botanic gardens. But there's a fourth dimension that I think is really critical, and I call it the cultural impact of the work that we do. Because organizations are also about expressing the identity of the communities they serve. For example, if I go to Singapore and in the botanic gardens there, I want to learn about Singapore. I want to learn about the plant life there, the community there, the stories there. They don't need to be the same stories that we share here, for example, in Melbourne, or, or, and indeed in Cranbourne, with very different um, gardens. So the question really is, the impact for whom? And how well do we understand our visitors and their emerging and evolving needs? So we're going to go to context first. And you'll know this because there's a red panda. So every time I, I shift topic, you'll see a red panda. He's my son's favorite animal. They're very expressive. Um, and I do love this one, trying to make sense of a global pandemic. Um, so the thing about context is we don't often have influence in context. So I describe it as embrace it. We don't have a lot of choice. So let's learn how to embrace and work with it. So not to put too fine a point on it, but it is important to remember that we have just experienced what's often described as the black swan event, which is an unpredictable or unprecedented um, global event that was indeed predicted um, by many people prior to it happening. Um, but took the rest of us unawares. Um, this uh, news article on your right is, was from The Age here in Melbourne. Um, it's only September 15th. Today, I'm going to say, is October 28th. We are very much in the very early recovery period of the first major pandemic of the 21st century. And what that means is we really don't know a lot about what's changing for our visitors because it's happening right now. Um, and I like to share this content without context is noise. So we work in content-rich organizations. We have so many stories, we never know where to start. You know, every plant has a story, every blossom has a story, every tree has a story, every landscape has a story. It's so rich, it's sort of mind-blowing. But without responding to context around us, it will be perceived as noise. So what do we know right now? Well, we know that COVID is still with us. It's definitely continuing to impact many vulnerable members of our community and our health workers. Just worth noting, you know, they're still in the trenches. Other things which, um, and I've, I've just recovered from two surgeries this year. So many people have had even things like elective surgery delayed, um, challenges at home financially, now, these are very real and um, important issues for the people we serve. Um, so it's important to note that in, in the way that we engage and think about our storytelling. And as I've just said, we've recalibrated and re reprioritized a lot of our needs, wants, values, trends, systems, behaviors, and hierarchies. Just one example from an incredibly well-researched field. If you ever want to learn about Australia, go to the Tourism Australia website, a country built on tourism. Love it. Um, and of course, I'm an immigrant, so I love it even more. Um, what's interesting about this slide is that this is one snapshot. It's from March this year. And this industry refreshes this data every two months, two to three months. It's quite fascinating. But in one snapshot from 19, uh, sorry, 2019 to 2022, we had lost 89% of tourism um, earnings in Australia. 
And that equivalent, equiv uh, bear with me, the word will come out shortly, is the equivalent of $4.9 billion to the Australian economy. And I only highlight that because that's many family businesses, many small businesses, young people's futures, all wrapped up. It's a lot of hospitals, schools, and botanic gardens. Other things about the pandemic have, sh have really shifted how visitors engage with organizations like ours. In an upside, and this is um, some fantastic research out of the US, the pandemic has shifted the types of cultural entities that people want to visit. In good news for Bot Gardens, they want to come outside. They want to go to zoos. They want to be out of doors. Um, theaters are still struggling to bring audiences back, for example. All of those indoor activities have that shifted. Another interesting piece of data that I picked up, and this is another fantastic woman, Colleen Dylan Schneider, is that there's increased competition for leisure activity. And I think most of you will appreciate that actually the competition is travel to see family, not to see attractions as we might have done in the past. You know, I want to go to the water park in Queensland. It's now I'm going to Queensland because I haven't seen my father in three years. And the time spent will therefore impact our organizations, who comes and what they want to do when they get here. And again, economic community, social recovery, new policy and investment, it's all evolving as we speak. I, I don't want to put too fine a point on this, but I do think it's also important to note that mental illness is a growing concern, particularly amongst the very young. We used to talk about secondary students, you know, as very much the, the place for early intervention. The top article here is from um, NPR radio in, the, in um, America, and the bottom article from The Age in Melbourne. So I believe a whole of society response is required, and that's regardless of the cause or organization you work for. We need to be thinking about these young people and what they're going to need to participate in the future. Again, uh, just worth noting, um, inequity is rife. 1% of the global population owns 46% of the wealth, and that's only growing. Um, my other favorite stat, more men named John, <laughs> run big companies than all women. Um, and Tim Entwistle, after I gave this presentation, said, well, you know my middle name is John. Well, <laughs> I said, yes, I did when I picked this up. So, you know, again, our organizations have a role to play in addressing these challenges. Who's doing the speaking? Who's doing the leading? And how do we address that? And I, again, I'd like to just highlight that political and cultural fragmentation is all around us right now, but it's not uniquely so. So this is WB Yeats after World War I and the Spanish flu. Things fall apart, the center cannot hold, mere anarchy is loosed upon the world, surely some revelation is at hand. That was in 1921, just over 100 years ago. And again, this has happened so quickly, it's less than half my lifetime. Um, it, but we, we sort of don't even talk about it anymore. Digital technology has dynamically changed the way we um, experience our, the civic realm. Um, and it's worth talking about. So this is the first of case studies that, we're, um, that you'll see through the presentation. And this is from Seeing the Invisible. It was, it's an augmented reality art exhibition. And I had a wonderful volunteer from Cranbourne and say to me, you know, it's digital, it's not real, you know, I'm a bit cranky, I don't know, well, how do I tell visitors about it? And I said, you tell them that it's light touch on the landscape. It's a perfect exhibition for a botanic garden. And it's artists talking about the precariousness of um, our current climate. And it was great. It was a really good conversation. So what are our gardens doing to respond to context? Well, we've commissioned a Nature for Health and Wellbeing report. This is a global literature review, and it's publicly available on our website. We're talking more about nature for health and well-being. You'll hear that a lot in our communications. There is an absolutely global consensus that time in nature does help mental health 
and physical health. And this is from the UK, where um, in a world first, physicians can prescribe nature for people struggling with mental health or illness. Um, I, I, just on a personal note, my son has mental illness, and every now and again when the, the anxiety is rising, I say to him, that's it, we're going out in nature, get in the car, nature prescription. And we drive up to Latrobe around the beautiful land there, and within 20 minutes, he's calmed right down. So I, at first hand, I've seen the value of this work. We've developed new programs, botany boot camp, where you get out in your physical, you learn about plants, and of course address the, 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 the biggest challenge of all is, as my fearless leader would say, plant blindness. The other thing we've done is we've undertaken a full research study on our social history. What are the contributions of women to Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne? And I'll, I'll share with you, I, I shared this with all staff the other day, is that if you go to the Kew Botanic Gardens website and you search for women and their role at Kew, there is one landing page with four women in bonnets. I'm exaggerating. Um, but we now have an 85-page report that tells us the, the first scientist, the first horticulturalist, the first manager, the first volunteer. And it's really rich resource. So innovation can happen just for staff, just amongst yourselves. It's not, it doesn't have to be at that level I discussed earlier. So embracing context is an opportunity to innovate for greater impact. It maintains our relevance, demonstrates leadership, and responds appropriately to current need. So just a bit of a cook's tour on context there. On purpose, second favorite panda, um, as long as you're breathing, it's never too late to do some good. Um, yeah, love him. Just great. <laughs> so good. You have, you have to learn. And Maya Angelou, must love. Um, many, many people have seen this global talk. His name is Simon Sinek, and it's How Great Leaders Inspire Action. What he describes is that people do not buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And in content-rich organizations like ours, we talk a lot about the what, you know, what is happening in the gardens, what is going on. But actually what people are seeking from us is meaning. They're seeking to understand the purpose as well. And your purpose is your why. It's the heart of what makes your organization distinct from mine. And it's expressed through vision, values, and so on. Meaning is what visitors are seeking when they engage with us it is decided by the individual, and it accrues over time. So this is, this is something I'm quite happy to share with you. We conducted some research into the behavioral motivations of our visitors here at Royal Botanic Gardens in Melbourne. And I share it with you because I expect that the motivational segments for your botanic gardens are somewhat similar. And what we learned, and to our great surprise, is that only 14% of our visitors were plant lovers. The vast majority were here for mind and body, for social connection, and so on. And interestingly, for those of you who are involved in any fundraising efforts, the two segments most likely to give to our organization were the curious explorers and those choosing to pass through, which I just found quite fascinating. So again, post-pandemic, as these behaviors and motivations change, we need to learn, and, and perhaps our purpose may need to evolve as well. So I'd like to just highlight quickly the number of whys for a botanic gardens organization. Again, I'm not sure we talk enough about this, but civic responsibility and pride is so important. The, you know, when, even when I met the wonderful volunteers from Kings Park the other day, and I, I've studied in WA, that, that's one thing I remember very much from living in that city is the pride I had, even as a visitor, in King's Park. And that was, you know, it's part of what makes that city great. We have a duty of care as a purpose as an organization to pass on our knowledge and our wisdom to the next generation. We, organizationally, we need to know that the best available scientific and, uh, evidence underpins our community's decision making. And for those of you with herbaria, which I think are perhaps a number of the of, um, people here today, 
that's a critical focus for our work as well. And also programs and experiences, they nudge our visitors toward um, greater values for nature and more actions for nature. And lastly, on commitment to reconciliation, it de it's not just a good thing to do or an important thing to do. It also demonstrates integrity. And here's a really good example from the Jefferson Museum in the US where President Jefferson had a known long-term relationship with a slave. Um, her name was Sally Hemings, and he met her when she was 14. And the organization has finally said, we're going to stop tiptoeing around the truth-telling of, of his presidency. And so I think you'll see through our new uh, wayfinding here at the gardens in a couple of months, much, much more focus on reconciliation, on country, and on the truth-telling of our sites. And I encourage you to search out those stories for your sites as well. So again, why do we revisit purpose? It's important to keep talking about it. It's a great way to bring supporters to the organization, and it improves storytelling, decision-making, and stewardship, and it adds a great deal of social value and economic value to our work. Um, I might fly through this one, but I'll, I only highlight it because we hear a lot, you know, particularly I'm responsible for programs, but also for marketing, for communications, and fundraising, and tourism, and retail. Um, we hear a lot about know your visitor, but I have a great focus at the moment on respect your visitor, because the stories they have, why would I have all the knowledge? You know, what people bring to us is in really important. So again, Maya Angelou, start by speaking to people rather than walking by them like they're stones that don't matter. And again, a word about civic participation. I think when people come to Botanic Gardens, it's like when they come to public libraries and art galleries, the, the incredible institutions that support our communities. It's, it's a political act. They're coming because they care about these places. They want to learn. And it has particular value for them, both individually and collectively. Because the number one factor in engagement is relevance. The visitor decides our effectiveness and our impact. Visitors, stakeholders, funders evaluate our worth. And when I spoke at the Congress, just on this slide, I said, you know, on this day, does this couple particularly care that we do incredible genomic research <laughs> at our botanic garden? Now, we know they should. But on this day, we were providing something very, very different for them that was, at that time, equally, perhaps, if not more important. So respect for the visitor is, is really an opportunity to exchange ideas to work out hidden barriers to participation in our work. Like, why don't they want to know about genomic research? They should want to know. And so therefore, how do we work out what the barriers to action are? Uh, globally, 750 million to a billion visitors per annum visit Botanic Gardens. So it's a lot of people with some amazing stories. Jane, you're going to help me keep on time too, aren't you? you give me the, the flag or the, OK, thank you. Um, and also co-designing our experiences. So I'm super keen moving forward here at the gardens, for example, and we can road test this with volu our volunteers, is, you know, let's bring in and prototype some new programs, activities, bring in different age groups, you know, bring in a primary group, bring in a secondary group, bring, bring in a group with uh, diverse needs or indeed mental illness. Let's trial what they want to hear from us and learn from that. Um, I think all of those things are important. Um, and lastly, but definitely not least, for a room full of communicators, is communicate persuasively. Now, I know you were waiting for Aristotle to arrive, and here he is. Um, I still love the art of rhetoric, and the reason for that is it's actually about persuasive communication. And persuasive communication relies on three key um, pillars, really, credibility, logic, and emotion. So some of you will be well aware, ethos, pathos, and logos. 
Um, so just as one example of, of a way to think about the, the work that we present, the communications we put out in the world, this is a book launch that we launched in 2019 at Cranbourne. It's a children's book for two to six years. Um, and I am standing in front of a very large southern brown bandicoot. Um, and again, just as a fun fact, and you probably learned this when you were at Cranbourne this week, but the, the way to tell the difference between a rat and a southern brown bandicoot is the bandicoot has a booty like Beyonce. So you will never forget now how to tell the difference between a southern brown bandicoot and a rat. But I mention it because botanic gardens, in terms of integrity, we've got heaps. People trust our organizations. They really believe we're knowledge keepers, and we are. So credibility isn't normally an issue, and it won't be for any of you. I know the confidence. I've seen our volunteers and the long history and knowledge that you, that you have. People trust you when you're speaking to them. And that's an incredibly valuable thing to have from the get-go. Secondly, however, is thinking through the impact of our communication. What emotion do we want to evoke in our visitors when they come? And I, I just share this because it's really valuable to think very carefully about that. So today, before I present it to you, I did think, what, what did I want to leave you with? Did I want you to feel provoked or um, intrigued or surprised, amazed, um, uh, sleepy, you know, any of the above. I, I thought about it before I came, and I think when we're communicating with visitors, it's, it's really valuable to do so. And I'm very happy, by the way, to share this presentation afterwards, so, you know, feel free. But lastly, and this is an area I think that botanic gardens, um, often scientific organizations, surprisingly fail in, this is my personal view, particularly for organizations that are incredibly driven by great minds, is actually on logic. And by logic, I mean the distillate. What is the most important idea? And what's the order in which they're presented? And this is a great um, communications triangle. It was shared with us recently in a, in a training session. And I thought, you know, th this, is, this is how we think about how we present. Most important information first, supporting details, general at the end. There is a fantastic talk just there. You know, today's talk is on why botanic gardens are important, A, B, C. So do we think the messages have to be the same across botanic gardens? And I'll share with you at the Congress that there were uh, some voices saying they should be that to address climate change, that every time you went to a botanic gardens, you needed to hear the same narrative. And I, I will say that surprised me. And the reason for that is, in particular, because climate change, and certainly my response to, to um, David Caroli's speech, was very much around flight. Uh, you know, it, it's a huge threat. It's a wicked problem, as we've discussed. I think I need to go home under my doona. Um, so at the gardens, we've thought a lot about the kind of emotion we want to engender in our visitors and the response, therefore. And we've moved into this territory, so new territory, surprising uh, um, and mapping, such that the effect is exploration and orientation. And the researcher um, is the same from the prior slide, uh, Pulchik. So as storytellers, we need you more than ever. And I think your role in storytelling and research translation is more important now than ever. Um, again, a couple of other examples, one from the gardens here in learning and the other from tourism. People are seeking our stories and an authentic engagement with us. Um, and just for a bit of fun and um, not again, because I find working looking for examples across industries and sectors really helps me keep my own practice fresh. So this is from social marketing. In public health, we want to change behaviors very quickly and in one image and one tagline. So you can't look at these two campaigns and not know who the key audience is. 
what their barriers to engagement are and what you're trying to change. They're fabulous. I, I really encourage you to look at um, World Health Organization does this well, not always, but often. Even the comms that came out for COVID so quickly, you just immediately knew, you know, you had to be apart to be together. And remember the blocks moving all around. Um, these are great skills when we need to rely on our communicators, our graphic designers, our copywriters as well. Sorry, Jen, I just think I flew something on the floor there. Got too excited. So if behavior change is the end game of all of our work, Another great example, this girl can. I'm slow, but I'm lapping everyone on the couch. Um, that campaign has won over 50 global awards, and 49% of women who engage with the campaign describe themselves as more active now. So I share that because I think these are really rich examples for botanic gardens. I think we have to get better at trusting our marketers, first of all, but also making sure that we've really thought through what is the desired behavior change. And at RBGV, we decided that it was hope and agency and a little thing I call wonder. And I credit Tim Entwistle with this title, although we did workshop it back and forth many, many, many times. But wonder is what we're trying to inspire and in, engender in our visitors. And this story, as Rosemary said, is where we put the people who visit our gardens at the center. Um, we describe them as sentinels, knowledge keepers, storytellers, and visionaries. And we profiled not just donors or scientists, but also our staff. Jenny Happel is in our book. The, everybody that contributes to a botanic gardens organization like ours. And that included our state scientists, here in Victoria, this is Dr. Amanda Caples. She described having an epiphany about her science career whilst walking here at RBG Melbourne. We focused on our staff. This is Warren Warboys. I'm sure you may have met him this week. Warren has just passed his 50th anniversary at Royal Botanic Gardens, Victoria. He started at 16 years of age. And again, we don't profile our people enough. You know, the people who work in our organizations are incredible, and we need to keep telling their stories as well, because their enthusiasm is contagious. We also focused on people like Tan Lee. She's a global and successful entrepreneur based in San Francisco. She flies back every year to come to the gardens with her family, and that's, um, I'm going to say, three generations of Tan's family. And again, allows us to acknowledge the traditional owners. And I'm blessed and, and relieved to share with you that the traditional owners for our gardens approved this forward. It was very um, carefully shared, workshopped together, and approved. So I, you know, I can um, move on and feel happy about that. And just in wrapping up, I'm going to just fly you through a few examples of how we also use our programs here at the gardens to innovate and to respond to the changing context around us. So I've mentioned seeing the invisible. We also have Floor and the Baron, so we're moving much more to audio, storytelling where people can do self-guided tours, soon paid and unpaid. But um, for those of you who've been to Mona, a really great way to navigate through um, outdoor uh, collections like these. Same with Sonica Botanica, it's a curated audio experience. Um, of course, our focus on Aboriginal culture will be similar to your organization's very important work, forest therapy, and so on. Um, in 2018, we put the gardens on fire. Um, it was pretty provocative and exciting at the time. We had 30,000 people through in four days. Um, and it absolutely represented the values of our organization, which are brave, creative, remarkable, and open. This year, we launched Lightscape. It's all in the title, Light Nature Wonder. Um, and I highlight it because it's those collaborations with other organizations where we, we learn and, and um, 
develop together. So what are the results? There they are, the results pandas. Um, yeah, love them. So a few results. As Rosemary mentioned, we were um, grateful to receive the gold as a major tourist attraction at the Australian um, Qantas Australian Tourism Awards. I'm thinking about your comment about my dress, Rosemary, because I actually did kind of like think about it today. Um, <laughs> But I didn't wear the gown, so I'm sorry about that. But I wore the same earrings. The bees are in. Um, we were so proud to win that award because it's incredibly rare for Botanic Gardens to win a major tourism award in a country that's so rich in tourism destinations. And we were particularly proud because it was for the whole organization. It was for Cranbourne Gardens and for Melbourne. And it was to do with innovation. We also launched a gin. I'm sure many of your organizations have, have your boutique gin. But we're rather proud of this. It was selected from ingredients from both gardens. It was curated by our DCE and um, one of our top botanists. And that gin has gone on to win a global award as well. Now, what's interesting about that is it just means other people start to tell your story. I think if we think about our visitors ultimately as advocates, that they'll come and then they tell somebody at the dinner table or beyond, that's a really valuable target for us to have. We've also seen significant growth in our fundraising. I'm very proud of these results. Individual projects, trusts and foundations, gifts and wills, kind of coming off the floor, which is fantastic. Director's Circle membership, which is our key donor um, program, has increased in numbers and revenue raised. Um, I, I, we did have social media in 2017. I just want to be clear. It wasn't like we didn't have it. It didn't register in this particular graph. Um, but when we started this campaign around innovation, around changing the experiences for people here at the gardens. We had 8,000 followers on Instagram, and we now have 94,500 followers. Yeah. And that's comparable to major galleries, zoos, anywhere in Australia. Also, our program participation has increased quite significantly as a result. This is an example from a, the campaign we ran in our 175th year. It's just to, to share with you a kind of a shift of the flavor of how um, perhaps we had communicated visually to, you know, as you'll see, the kind of shifts and changes in the way we communicate visually now. It was um, a punt to go with Together We Gather um, in the middle of the pandemic. Um, but a great partnership with Yarra Trams. And as I like to say, it's fine. Only four people saw it. So um, <laughs> if there was any issue, they were within five kilometers. And um, uh, we got wonderful feedback for this campaign. And something else I'd like to highlight, and maybe circling back to where I began, is you know this was a presentation I gave to the Bo Global Botanic Gardens Congress. And the audience was full of plant scientists, horticulturalists, engagement and education uh, leadership and staff from botanic gardens around the world. What I'm particularly proud of is that we wrote the bid. There was an internal team who wrote the bid. And we won against rather significant botanic gardens organizations around the world based on the theme. And the theme was Influence in Action, Botanic Gardens as Agents of Change. And I mention that because if we get our storytelling right, if we're able to distill it, what excited me about the Congress was seeing an entire community of practice focus on change, on becoming change makers, and what might that mean? Knowing, of course, they already were, but putting it on steroids in a way through the themes of the Congress around global conversations and indigenous participation, around cities, urban cities and greening, plant conservation, 
um, this work, Surviving and Thriving Post-COVID, and another great theme that I'm, I'm going to lose, but it's okay. Um, but if we communicate well, we can influence change very widely. Um, and it was a tremendous success. So I hear a lot that botanic gardens are hidden gems. You know, nobody knows where we are. Nobody gets us. But I think of botanic gardens as sleeping giants, sometimes, awaking giants, perhaps. Um, and just as I'm wrapping, I wanted to share with you, you know, in terms of seeking examples of great stories and great projects around the world to influence our work. This launched this year in Swedish Lapland. It's called Biosphere, and it's part of the Tree Hotel series in, um, in Lapland. What you can't see is this is a two-story Airbnb. Um, you move in on ground level, and it's sort of the, you know, the lounge room, and then the second floor is the bedroom. It's surrounded by 350 birdhouses, developed and curated with a noted ornithologist in Sweden. And when I saw this, I thought, wow, my work's done. <laughs> if I could get people in here, I wouldn't need to do much more storytelling. So if we do need to share a theme, I think it's Grow Your Wonder. And just to finish, I, again, would like to thank you for your time, thank you for your attention, and wish you very well in your onward journey. Thank you. Well, there's certainly lots of food for thought, and um, thank you for that exciting, challenging, and very lively presentation. <laughs> Um, of course, Robin is head of the division where the volunteers all fall into. I'm not sure that's the right verb I should be using, but um, we always have a very strong support from Robin and her team. So thank you very much. And please join me in thanking Robin again. Well, we, you may be grateful, I'm not sure, but we're coming to the end of the conference week. <laughs> um, we did start, or I s mentioned very early on about having a photograph of the 2005 hosting of this co conference here. Um, and thank you for those who put your names up there. Uh, I did omit one thing, and I forgot to mention it yesterday. I've actually now put up, both here and in Domain House, a map of our gardens where there are whole lot of commemorative trees that were planted by the volunteer guides to celebrate particular anniversaries.